Hello there ladies and gents, welcome to another repair video. Today we're going to be looking at this Xbox One X which has been sent in. And this has been sent in because it's turning on but not displaying any video on the screen. At the moment I don't really have a very elegant way of showing the video output. So I'm going to take my face camera and spin it around just so you can see that it's not going to produce any signal. But the HDMI cable that's in right now is connected to the TV above me and it does 100% work. So I'll spin the camera around and show you what's going on. So unfortunately at the minute because I haven't got my other capture card set up properly, this is the best way I'm going to be able to show you but this is basically what's happening. We're getting no signal to the TV and if we take a look down here let's see if it decides to recognize anything on the screen. And unfortunately, it doesn't. So if I just go to my HDMI sources, it's on HDMI 2, which is the correct input source, and it's got no video. So as you can see, the Xbox isn't displaying anything on the screen. Unfortunately, I'm in, well, I'll say unfortunately, it's a good thing, but I'm in Workshop 2.0 right now. As you can see, this is my loft. So I recently built this workshop. Just yesterday, I finished it. And I don't have everything set up, so I can't load up the capture card or anything like that without messing up the sources and things. So I need to get my splitter and things like that set up so as I can switch between the HDMI for the microscope and the console input and things like that. So I will get to that, but at the minute this is not displaying anything on the TV. The HDMI cable that's in there right now is linked directly to the TV. So that definitely works. I did test that literally just this morning while I was working on another device. So we're going to take a look. It's most likely going to be the HDMI retimer, but, you know, it's it could be something different. It could be something completely different. So we're going to take a look. We're going to see what we can do, hopefully get this working and deliver some good news just before Christmas for the customer. But with that being said, if you are new to the channel and you like this type of content, then please hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notifications. That way you don't miss any future videos. It takes literally two seconds. Two seconds to subscribe and make me look a little bit more popular. And if you want to support me, then you can head over to Twitch. There's a link in the video description. I do stream on Twitch and you can become a Twitch Prime subscriber. Absolutely free for you, but it does give me around, around about $2.50 every month. You can also support me on Patreon. I don't really shit it very often, but I am on Patreon. There'll be a link to that in the video description as well, as well as a join button where you can become a channel member on YouTube using the join button below the video. And there's also a direct donation link on the video as well. So with the shilling out of the way, let's get to the repair. All right, so you might hear a little bit of background noise. My four-year-old son, Cody, as many of you will know who I'm referring to, he has this weird thing where he likes to basically just play the same YouTube shorts over and over and over and over again. I've heard it sing the same thing for about 30 minutes. With that being said, I've still got work to do. So like I said, this is probably going to be something to do with the HDMI retimer or redriver. If you want to call it a redriver, it's the same thing. I don't know why people moan over it, to be honest. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a couple of tests. There should be a way that we can test the HDMI chip and confirm whether or not that's at fault. There's a little capacitor on the circuit just below the chip and it's marked with C50. And what we can do is we can test that in resistance mode on the multimeter and anything less than around about 2000 ohms usually indicates a bad chip. Usually when the chip is bad, it will read around about 300 ohms. So it doesn't read short, but it does come up at around about 300 ohms. So that's usually the quickest way that we can diagnose the chip to be at fault. But I'll show you how we do that. If I can ever get this thing off. I hate these Xbox One X cases. There's something to talk about in the video description. Let me know. The most annoying console or the most annoying device that you take apart. Let me know in the comments what you think. And while you're doing that, I'm going to skip through this part because, yeah, it's annoying. So I'll get this disassembled and I'll resume the video when I'm done. 
Right, okay, so here we are then, just about ready now. So this has been taken apart before. So someone's been in here, whether that was just to give it a service in the past, I don't know, but it's been taken apart before, nonetheless. So that's something to note. So let me zoom in here. Okay, and as you can see, we've got this chip here, which is the HDMI encoder, the retimer, redriver, it's the TDP158, and that is responsible for taking the audio and video signals, muxing them, and then sending them out to the HDMI port. So it comes in from the APU. So you've got the APU just down here off camera. So the signals come out of the APU, they come up here, they come through this chip, and then they go out to the HDMI port and the ESDIC. So there's really not a lot that can fail on these particular circuits. The main thing that fails, like I said, is the HDMI encoder, but it could also be this chip here, U21, which is the ESDIC, the electrostatic discharge. And this basically protects against things like lightning strikes and things like that, power surges, and it protects the APU from becoming damaged in the event of a power surge. Now, the unfortunate thing is that those chips can't be purchased, or they probably can, but we don't know what the chip is. So we can get the one for the Xbox One S. It's the HDMI C24, I think it is, for the Xbox One S, but we can't get them for the One X because there's no actual markings on the chip. So we know what it is, we know what it does, we know what it's responsible for, but we can't buy it. If anyone knows, so we pop the black probe on a ground point and the red probe on the top of this capacitor. Um, we're actually reading 500 ohms, 600 ohms. So 600 ohms still tells me that this is short because we, could, we should be expecting around about 3,000 to 10,000 ohms. 600 ohms is too low, so that could indicate a short there. So what we can also check is the capacitors around... U21 for any kind of shorts there. Uh, we get 600 ohms there as well, which is quite weird. I'm not sure on the exact reading we're supposed to get there, but 600 seems a little bit low to me. Let's go into beat mode. And we're not getting anything on that. So no shorts around there, apparently. One thing I am noticing is that the HDMI port doesn't look factory. So I'm going to inspect that under the microscope and just see what the condition is of that. Okay, so you can see here that this has clearly been changed in the past. Definitely not a factory port. So what I will do is I'll do what we call a nudge test and just see if any of these pins are not connected. That's not great. They're not soldered great. Yeah, see that one there is pretty much unconnected. So that could be causing it, and that one. Uh, is that pin 14? Yeah, pin 14 is fine. I'm not bothered about pin 14. So pin 14 is a non-connected pad. Ah, pin 19, there we go. So pin 19 is 5 volt return. So basically, you've got pin 18, which is 5 volt out, and you've got pin 19, which is 5 volt return, and that is not soldered. So we're not getting 5 volt return there at all. So basically, I believe that, I could be wrong, but I believe this is also the hot plug detect line. So basically, I think the way that it detects it is when it, fit, when it detects 5 volts coming back from the HDMI port, that tells it that the HDMI cable has been plugged in and then it goes 
down to the U21 for the ESD Boost IC. And then it comes from there and does all of its processing. So that's not connected. So these need a touch up. So I'm going to do that first and then I'm going to test it again. So I won't just touch up pin 19, I will touch up all of the pins. So the first thing I'll do is just add a little bit of flux here. And then I'm just going to come in with the iron. Let's melt that flux so I can see. And I'm just going to drag some solder across. Let's just keep dragging it back and forth. And every so often I'm just cleaning off my iron. And that's slowly getting rid of the excess solder. So we don't need to sit there wicking it away if we can get it off with the iron. Might need to wick it just a tad. Seems to have something strange going on in this corner. It might be a trace. So there might be a damaged pad under there. All right, so I'm going to have to wick it away a little bit. There we go. All right. I'm going to clean this up and then I'll give it a quick test. Give it another nudge test and just see what's going on. So I'm not sure if this HDMI port was changed before or after the display issues that we're facing. There's not really any information on the paperwork that came with it. I'm just using some IPA just to clean it up with a cotton swab. There we go, that's nice and clean, no more flux. So what I'm going to do now is just give it another nudge test and just see if they are any better. Yeah, that pad is missing. So that pad that ended up over here has come from here. So that was damaged. So we're going to need to run a jumper wire. Now the jumper wire for pin 19 is actually underneath the BGA. And I don't want to take this chip off because... It's a BGA and I don't really fancy really boiling it. So I'm going to come to a closer point with some small jumper wire. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to expose some of this trace. So if we take a look at the port itself, where we've got number 19, that's the pin number. We can see that the trace comes down here. It's going to be rather difficult for me to get this close to it. So I'm going to come to this point just here somewhere where it's going to be nice and easy for me to access 
not every job has to be difficult. So I'm just going to expose this trace. And scratch it away with the blade there. So the reason I expose the copper is because we need somewhere to solder a wire to. And while, while the coating is still on the board, the solder mask or PCB mask, we're not going to be able to solder to it. So exposing that trace just gives me somewhere to solder to. And then what I need to do is just tin that so as it's ready to accept a jumper wire. So I need to put some solder on it. So I'm just going to use the edge of my iron. And there we go. See, that's it. See that turn silver there? So that's ready for a jumper wire now. So for this, I'm going to use some 0.1 millimeter. 0.1 millimeter might seem small, but in terms of jumper wire on HDMI traces or any trace on a salt on a PCB, it's not really that small. And um, when you're under the magnifying glass, it does get a little bit easier. So we need to expose this. So this is basically enamel wire, so it's coated. So what we need to do is just expose some of the inner core by scraping it with the iron. And then I'm going to come to the pin first. I'm just going to push a little bit of this flux here. And just solder that jumper wire there. And then I'm going to shape it. I'm going to try and get it in roughly the right shape. So as it's as close to being factory as possible. Don't want the wire longer than we need it to be. So I'm going to take some tweezers. And you see how I roughly measured it out, but I've measured it fairly close to being spot on. So where the wire is exposed is where the trace is exposed as well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hold this with my tweezers just in place like that. And then I'm just going to solder this. It's actually moved out of the way there without me realising, but never mind. Alright, hold it again. Okay, there we go. By no means perfect. I'm just going to trim that. And then I'm going to heat up the area just to get rid of that burnt flux. And I just realised that my microscope is out of focus. Sorry about that. So I'm just going to heat up the flux so I can see what I'm doing. So I'm assuming that because of this missing trace I'm assuming that this HDMI port was changed and they took out the trace while changing it and that's why it's here instead of working it's a bold assumption to make whoops okay that's just come off there a bit strange is that trace damaged I think it could be I think the actual trace might be damaged because that was tinned. Or is that just burnt flux covering up where I've tinned it? Hmm. I think we might have had a little bit of heat exposure to this. It looks a little bit iffy. So I'm going to have to do this jumper wire again now. I'm going to come to here. So I'll come to this corner here instead, because this doesn't look great here. So I'll come to that corner instead, and I'm going to do that again. It's fine.
I should have probably come a bit further to start with rather than trying to go close to it. I'm just going to desolder that one from there. Let's add some flux. That tinned a lot better on there. That tinned a million times better. So now I'm just going to tin the wire itself. And solder it to the pin. So I'm going to do the same again. I'm going to try and shape it in roughly the right shape. There we go. Let's hold that in place there. Let's warm this up again. So the reason I warm up the flux is because when it dries and burns, it gets a little bit difficult to clean up. So I warm it up first and that allows me to clean it up a lot better. And a lot easier than if I didn't do it. Alright, that should be good. I'll just partially trim that. I don't want to press too hard on the blade. I can break it manually. Didn't want to press too hard on the blade because I don't want to end up cutting into the board. But what I'm going to do now is just expose a little bit more of this. Just so I can check for continuity. So I want to just make sure that we've actually got a good connection from the pin to the trace. So I'll go from here. And yes indeed, that is now complete and the circuit is restored. So that should be good for that. Now I'm going to need to test it now before I go any further. But what I want to do first is just make sure that I haven't made any mistakes by testing for any shorts on the port itself. And just make sure that we don't have continuity from one pin to the next. Good. Okay, so we've got no shorts. Let's give it a quick nudge test again. Oh, see, that one wasn't soldered either. Okay, that trace is actually damaged as well. That was pretty weak. I'm going to have to run a jumper there now as well. I did press on that a little bit too roughly. But if I could break that like that, then it wasn't fully soldered. Same as that one. That one's not fully soldered either. Let me just zoom in on this. Yeah, so actually these traces are all lifted. Yeah, these, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty rough. So we need a jumper. We're going to need a jumper here because that trace is lifted. That one wasn't me. This one up here was me, but it was a little bit weak anyway. Yeah, same as that one there. We're going to have no continuity there either. So I'm going to expose a trace there. That one's fine. Alright, so we've got pin 19 done. We're going to need to do pin 16 and 15 and pin number 1. So I'll start from the right hand side. 
So yes, I pressed a little bit too rough on that, but at the same time, if I could break that just by giving it a nudge test, which I do pretty much all the time, then it was weak anyway, and it needed it needed looking at. So I'm kind of glad that happened, to be honest. I don't mind running an extra jumper wire. The cost is going to be the same for the customer, whether it's one or five, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, so just make sure that's nice and clean. Good. And then I'm just going to check these contacts and make sure we've got a good connection. So I'll start with pin number one. Yep. Make sure we don't have a short on these pins. And that's good. So make sure there's no short on these pins. Nope. No short there. No short there. Good. And then down to the filter. Good. Or resistor rather. I think it acts as a filter though. And good. Excellent. So we've got a good contact on all of them. Let's just try and shape. P number one. So it's in the right place. Yep, that's fine. Uh, pin number thirteen is difficult to test because it goes through a via. Hmm, I've just restored fourteen and I didn't need to. Oh well, never mind. It's all good. Right, okay, so that appears absolutely fine. Let's just make sure that it's all dry before we proceed to the next step. So what I need to do now, because I've exposed these traces and we've run jumper wires, I'm going to need to put some conformal coating down. So I basically need to secure these in place and make sure that they're not going to go anywhere if anyone goes poking and prodding in the future. So I've got some Mechanic UVH900, this is UV curable solder mask. And this will basically just restore that solder mask that I scraped off and also add some across the jumper wires as well. You can get it from eBay for around about £4 per tube and it's really, really cheap because it lasts you a long, long time. So I'm just going to add some conformal coating there. Make sure it gets protected. Try and get rid of that little bit of fluff off there as well. So just make sure that the area is protected. You really don't need much. Just enough to cover it. There we go. Let's protect U21, or rather the part of U21 that I exposed. So I expose that for continuity checks, but I'm going to recover it up just to make sure we do a proper job. Whoops, slip there. Never mind. Oh, that's too much there. I mean, it's not too much. It's just it might take a little bit longer to cure. It's fine. So I'm going to protect that area as well. Make sure that it's good to go. And that it's not going to get damaged or short out on anything. Okay, there we go. So that's all protected. So what I want to do now is, well, the final task before I put it back together for testing is going to be to just cure this. So I need to cure this with a UV light. Okay, and that should be good. So I will give it a quick test. 
Let's have a zoom back in. And yep, that's hardened. So is that. And so is that. And so is that. Awesome. Okay, so that is all done. Time to give it a test. All right. So I'm going to clean off the old thermal paste. I'm going to reapply some fresh paste. And hopefully this is all we've got to do to this one. I'm not keen on the fact that it's only reading 600 ohms. It should definitely be higher than that. But is it going to be a case of it's just low because half of the traces were missing? Okay, so there's the old thermal paste cleaned off on the heatsink as well as the APU. Let's add some fresh. There we go. And then I'm going to put it back together enough for testing. Let's turn it on. And then I'm going to turn on the TV and I'll spin the camera around again. There we go. So that's in low resolution mode. But it should change when we change the settings. So I'll get the settings changed and then I'll test it again. Okay, and there you go. So it's in 1080p. It does pick up 4K. But this is connected just down here to a HDMI splitter. So unfortunately, it doesn't actually work in 4K. And I only found that out this morning. So that splitter, even though it says 4K, it doesn't work. So it'll let me select 4K, but then press yes, and it'll go back to the display that it's on. So I'm going to unroute this, and I'm going to hook it up straight to the TV. Okay, so it's on HDMI 1 now instead of 2. And uh, it's connected directly. As you can see down here, it's connected all the way up there into HDMI 1. So let's try it. Might need to reboot. Yeah, I think I need to reboot, to be honest. So I'm going to restart. And I'm also going to clean out the cable as well. So I'm going to clean out the cables, make sure... Well, I'll actually clean out the port and the cable. Just make sure that it doesn't have any flux in the port. Obviously, I didn't change the port, but... The last person who did mess with it could have could have got flux in there. So I'll just spray some IPA into it. And I'm also going to spray IPA on my cable. Make sure it ends up nice and clean. And there we go, Enable Enhanced Features. And there you go. Beautiful 4K UHD. So that pretty much sums it up. This was obviously a prior repair attempt. And unfortunately, it looks like someone damaged a few traces. The trace for the differential pair, I think it's data zero, uh, but the trace for differential pair number one, so pin one and three, and then the common ground. That one, if, if it was a proper trace, if it was actually there and it was actually making a good contact and it was strung, giving it that nudge test wouldn't have damaged it. So... Yeah, I mean, technically I did press it a little bit harder than I could have done, but I'd rather press it harder than normal because if it breaks for me, then there's a chance that it's not making a good contact anyway. So, yes, I could have gone a little bit lighter-handed on it, but I'm glad that I did go heavy-handed because, obviously, it told me that the trace was definitely weak and I didn't press it no harder than the rest of the pins. So, 
yeah, I've run, what was it, four chases, I think it was, four or four, four chases, so basically four chases and this console worked perfect. So obviously the last person who worked on it damaged the chases and that caused it to not display. The five volt return, that was the main one. So I think it probably would have displayed in low resolution with one of the pins being weak on uh, one of the differential pairs. But uh, I don't know about pin 15. That might not have displayed with pin 15. I can't remember what pin 15 is off the top of my head. But basically, by running them traces anyway, we've managed to get it working. And this customer can happily game once again. So that's going to be it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. I do really appreciate it. If you do have any comments or questions, leave them down in the comment section down below. If you want to organise your own repair, then you can do so by going into touch using the website in the video description. There'll be a link where you can book in the repair, you can view some common prices, and you can also get in touch about your repair as well. So if you've got a question about some of the repair services I ask, head over to the website, use the contact page, and that will come straight through to inbox. If you've got any questions on a repair that you want to try yourself, then there should be a Discord link in the video description as well. And if not, then I'll pin it to the top comment. But... There should be a Discord link in the video description as well. You can head over there and not only myself, but there are hundreds of people on there who might be able to help with your specific issue. If you want to support me, like I said earlier, you can do so by, number one, there's a donate link in the video description. That will take you directly to Square, which is my card payment processor where you can donate directly through card. There's a PayPal link, so you can donate through PayPal. There's also a Patreon link where you can become a Patreon supporter and support me monthly. There's a join button below the video where you can become a channel member and support me monthly or you can head over to Twitch where you can become a Twitch Prime subscriber. Absolutely free for you, but it does help me out a lot. So that's going to be it for this video. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, I'll see you later. Bye for now.